Dr. Justin Frank, the uh, author of uh, Bush on the Couch and Obama on the Couch and uh, numerous articles and, and a uh, uh, multiple visitor guest to our program, is uh, on the line with us. Dr. Frank is a psychoanalyst and clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at George Washington University. Uh, Bush on the Couch, as I said, Obama on the Couch, his previous books, ObamaOnTheCouch.com is the website, still using that URL. Uh, you can tweet him at Justin Frank, MD. Dr. Frank, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's, hi, Tom. Nice hi. To talk to you. It's great having you with us. Trump on the couch, inside the mind of the president. Um, <clears throat> before we before we get into your book, I'm curious if you were watching the hearings this morning, uh, where Dr. Bl uh, Bl Blasey Ford was testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee. No, I missed them all. Okay. I, you know, I would have, I would have loved to have gotten your thoughts on it, but uh, you know, perhaps another time. Um, I could make something up, but it would. <laughs> it wouldn't work. So, Donald Trump, what, uh, you know, where, where do you start when you're trying to psychoanalyze somebody who I assume you haven't met? Right. Well, one of the things that I remember from our last conversation, which I think was between the time he was elected and the time he took office. Yes. As I recall. Uh, yeah, towards the very end of 2016, I remember saying to you something that has turned out to be quite true, which is that he is the kind of person who will parentify the rest of us and make us have to take care of him rather than him as president take care of us, which is what all other presidents either try to do or, you know, make an effort to do. And that is that he externalizes responsibility and this way he allow, allows himself to be free, to be the baby, to do whatever he wants. And we're the ones who have to pick up after him, manage him, make sure he doesn't blow us up, all of those things. Is that a unique uh, uh, psychopathology, a lack of a developmental step or whatever? I mean, how rare is that kind of thing? And is it associated with his narcissism uh, or, or are they, you know, separate comorbidities? Well, they're comorbidities. I think that what's happened is that he is a person who functions the way uh, Unconsciously, he's not this kind of person, literally, but unconsciously, he's very much like a drug addict who needs to have his fix in order to manage anxiety. He's got so much anxiety that he doesn't know how to manage it. So what he's done growing up is he externalizes his anxiety by, you know, hitting other people as a kid. He was in detention every day by, uh, you know, converting any kind of impulse or any kind of feeling into an impulse that he acts on, like with his tweets or with uh, his sense of outrage. So what happens is by doing that, which is what addicts do, and that's why they need a fix, he gets us to be anxious mm. instead of him. Now, the fix he needs is his rallies. He needs that kind of a fix. Love and approval, basically. Love and approval, that will calm him down. It will manage his anxiety. So he needs the fix of going to rallies, the fix of having something external to himself that will calm himself down. So when I've treated people who are addicts, sometimes they'll come into my office extremely agitated in the beginning of a session. By the time they leave, they're calm and I'm agitated. <laughs> Okay. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what are they going to do when they leave? And are they going to start shooting up or whatever it is? I'm yeah. all agitated. Yeah. They have transferred their anxiety to me. I feel it. Wow. That's what he does. And it's amazing. So it is like an addict. It is like some alcoholics do. They make everybody else feel anxious so they don't have to feel it. I have. And that's one way of managing his anxiety. I have a couple of friends, uh, good friends, who are clinical psychologists, and actually we've had a, a couple of them on this program. Uh, one, a very close friend; another, just you know, a person who had written about it. And I thought, hey, let's get around and talk about it. Who have pointed out that, uh, and one physician, uh, a family practice doc. This was about a year ago. Who have all pointed out that since Donald Trump was elected, in their private practices with just average normal people, 
they're seeing an explosion in anxiety disorders. They're seeing, Absolutely. They're seeing an, a, a radical increase in, in requests for things like Valium or, or Prozac, uh, the physician was telling me, and the psychologist. So, so go ahead. Yeah. What do you no, well, when Trump, when Trump was born, when, by the time, when Trump was two, he had a near loss of his mother, who almost died following the birth of the younger brother. So, because, and because of this, he had a lack of a strong maternal force in his life. Well, presumably, he wasn't of, even touched or nurtured for a while during no, that period of time. No, before that, and he wasn't after that. So, and does so, he have detachment disorder? He well, he has a form of detachment disorder, but rather than talking about it diagnostically, I think the character, rather than calling things disorders, I think that his character is such that he never learned to contain anxiety. Parents help a child manage their anxiety because every child has anxiety. Every human being has anxiety right. of one kind or another. But he never had any help managing it. So what he's done is he's externalized it. What he's done is he makes all of your friends, patients, and my patients too, and people I know, uh, anxious because he disavows his own anxiety. That's how he manages it. He must be doing this in, in, uh, in double form to the people yes. in the White House, the people with yes. whom he works. I am sure that the people in the White House are extremely anxious, and they're anxious both because he makes them anxious, and they're worried about what he's going to do next. Right. And so I would think that when they watch him do a press conference like he did yesterday, I think those people were very anxious. They weren't entertained by his antics. They were afraid that he was going to say something horrible or do something uh, terrible. It was like the way a mother watches a kid, you know, uh, in the jungle gym or something, you know, you're right. afraid they're going to do something. And that's right. how he gets people to feel. And in fact, there were photo, photos released yesterday of uh, John Kelly, his chief of staff, General John Kelly, uh, yeah. with his face in his hands. And I mean, in these classic gestures of, oh, my God, or I can't believe that, or, oh, right. no. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, also, I can't take it. Right. Yeah. It's so not only so, I can't believe it, it's the anxiety is so great that he makes other people unable to even manage their own anxiety. So there are all these comparisons between Trump and Hitler and Trump and Mussolini and Trump and, and Duterte. Have we seen this kind of constellation of personality disorders and, or tics or types or whatever you want to call it in any other uh, modern or historic world leaders? And if so, uh, can we expect those patterns to be played out by Donald Trump? What do we learn from that? Well, if he's at all like Hitler, he's a poor man's Hitler because he doesn't know how to galvanize pride and how to make America feel good about themselves. He really does make us anxious. Hitler calmed people. He hmm. didn't make them anxious. Hitler said, we're being invaded by Jews and bad people and communists and whoever it was. So he organized and galvanized in a way that Trump sort of tried to do with the Mexican rapists and all that stuff and the Muslims. But, he, but because he doesn't love America the way Hitler loved Germany, which he did, right, he, idealized, he, idealized. Can't, he can't do that. He can't get us to feel that kind of patriotism. So he's not quite as dangerous as Hitler was because he's much incompetent, less basically. Dangerous, much less dangerous internationally. Right. I think he's dangerous because he's more destructive than Hitler because he, domestically, because he doesn't care about how our country is functioning. He only wants to get rid of taxes for the rich and get rid of regulations, which is unconsciously about his father, who he couldn't stand, uh, who was a great regulator right. of his behavior when he was a kid and kept trying to regulate him. So in that sense, he's not at all like Hitler, who was much more of a nationalist than Trump is. I don't think Trump cares that much about America. He only cares about himself because he's very needy. He needs right. love. He needs reassurance. So, and when you get rid of anxiety like that, you're left pretty hollow. 
you have to be able to hold your anxiety and manage it and, right. and make sense of it. And, and instead, he just gets rid of it. Yeah, it's called the keys of adulthood. He, Dr. Yeah, Frank, we, we, just, we only have two minutes until we're going to hit uh -oh. a hard break that I can't stop. Um, in those two minutes, what, what, do, what, how should America respond to Trump, A, and how should we all be responding to the anxiety that he produces in us? First thing we can do is to recognize that he can't change. So we have to stop complaining about him. We have to stop whining about him. We have to put that aside. This is who he is. He is our president, and we're stuck with him. And people need to accept that. It's like facing reality, which is something that Trump has never done. But we have to do it. Got it. Once we face reality, then we can start to think, because we're going to get rid of hope that he can change. We have to look inside. So that's what's happening in the electorate right now, where women, minorities, all kinds of people are running for office because they realize that we're, it's, our system is not going to help us. He is who he is, and there's no way around it. Once you accept that, you can take action. I think that's the most important single lesson of this presidency, because he is a living version of road rage, uh, mm. but it's not anonymous. It's presidential road rage in broad daylight. Yeah. And I think when that's writ large, we have got to accept that that's who is our leader, and we have to face it and not keep hoping that something is and this and that. We can try to control them if we can, like, but General Kelly can't. I mean, nobody can. So I think he, we need to have as many safety things as possible and vote anybody who is an enabler of his out of office. And that includes the entire, I'm sorry to say, Republican Party. Yeah, amen. It's like uh, Bernie Sanders always used to say, despair is not an option. Get active. And it yes. sounds like that's well, your he prescription. He's making us do it. He's making us do it. Yeah. If we really face it. Amen. The book, Trump on the Couch, Inside the Mind of the President, Dr. Justin A. Frank, MD, author of uh, Bush on the Couch. Dr. Frank, thanks so much. It's always great talking with you. Thank you. I enjoy it always, too. Thank you. I learned so much.